come and stand before your God. But there's another season of birth today. It is now time to use your your right to vote. One day in a wake up, you can go out and cast your vote for the candidate of your choice. Now people sometimes are uncertain about the person they should vote for, so they ask other people, you know, who should I vote for, or what should I? But that is your responsibility. That is your personal, personal right to choose the guy who fits your specific needs or who agrees mostly with you. So don't let nobody tell you who to vote for because if you vote for the person they tell you to vote for and you don't like what he's doing, then you can't complain because you voted for their person and he's doing what they want him to do. So choose your politician and go out and vote for him. Otherwise, you can't complain when things are not going good because you didn't contribute or didn't have any part in, in selecting that person. So I suggest we all vote so that we can get a guy in there who we think is going to do what we say, and then if he don't, we can call him up and tell him about it. Because <laughs> you were my guy, you know, and I voted for you, and you're not doing what I promised or what you promised. So that is just your civic duty. I'll say it that way. It's your civic duty so that our country can continue on the course that it's on, but better. <laughs> because um, you never get a guy in there that's going to do everything that you want him to do. You're never going to get a guy who will do everything that you want him to do. So you take the best you can get. But again, if you voted, then at least you have contributed. And if your guy don't win, you, you pray for the guy who does because you still want the country to work. So just because your guy don't win, don't throw up your hands and say, get it, and hope he dies or whatever. <laughs> you know, just, just pray for him. That he'll do the things that's best for the whole. That's what it, the government's supposed to do. It's supposed to serve everybody. And again, we have a privilege that a lot of people don't have. Because in those countries where there are monarchies and tyrants, they don't get to choose. They just get the guy who's in line, or whose time it is. And then they have to go with whatever he says. And they don't get to choose like that. So we're blessed in to live in a country with liberties and rights. So vote, keep them. That's all I got to say about that. Now, I have a question for you. Are you burdened down with worries, agitated, anxious, or fearful because the world is going crazy and there's chaos everywhere? The news that you see and everything that you hear is a downer. It's just not going the way you think it should be. And the world is in a panic. Well, I think that it's important that we know the things that are happening around us, the things that are going on around us. It's important that we know that, but it's also important that we know our position. And our position is we are in the world, but we are not of the world. Jesus said that in John 17, 16, as he's praying for you. And we know our shepherd's voice. We know who we listen to. And we should follow him. So the world's problems are not ours. Therefore, we should not be affected by them. Because we are on a different level. We are on a different plane. Our God will supply all of our needs through his riches. And when we follow him and go the way that he wants us to go, then 
we will always be all right. In the book of Second Chronicles, in chapter 2, Solomon, not Samuel, Solomon is appointed the king. And he seeks God. He's looking for God. And God appears to him and asks him a question. Ask him a question that says, what do you will that I do for you? What, in other words, what do you want me to do for you? And Solomon says, I'm a young man, inexperienced. I don't know how to go out or to come in amongst these great people. So what I need is wisdom and knowledge as to how to judge this great people. Now think of this. The Almighty God is asking him, what does he want? And he didn't ask for no car, no, no fine house, no clothes. He asked for wisdom and knowledge so that he could judge the people. And God said to him, so you got it. He granted him that wish. But then he went further. He said, because you didn't ask me for riches and wealth, and for me to kill your enemies or anything for yourself. I'm going to give you what you ask for. You will get knowledge and wisdom. You will also get riches and wealth more than any king that has ever been before you. And there will never ever be another king that will equal you. Because of his attitude. I'm talking about that selfishness that, that we tend to have. Solomon didn't ask for anything for himself. He asked for a way to serve the people. And God gave it to him. And then Solomon went ahead and prospered in that wisdom and riches that God had given him. He prospered. And he set up his assembly. He set up his administration, he put his kingdom in order, and then he built a king palace, and he built a temple for the Lord. And in the dedication of the temple, he prayed. Once he finished it, he prayed. And he prayed to God, and he asked God to bless the people. Bless the people who are in this assembly, who congregate here. And then he went further. He said, and if they sin and confess they sin and change, hear them in heaven and forgive them. And then he went a little further. He said, those who can't come to the temple to pray and to ask for forgiveness, wherever they are, if they've been taken captive or if they just can't get here, if they turn in this direction, and pray and ask for forgiveness. Hear it in heaven and forgive them for their sins. And, and we find Daniel stuck to that. But that's a different subject. But Solomon asked God for these things. And that night, as he tried to sleep, God appeared to him a second time. And this was his response to Solomon. And he appeared to him the second time. He responded to Solomon in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, right now, my eyes shall be open and my ears attentive unto the prayer that is made in this place. Right now, I'm going to start looking and listening for the prayers that the people send up to me. So he answered Solomon's prayer by appearing to him and giving him that personal attention saying that if they pray, 
if they humble themselves, if they turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear and heal them. So if they do these three things, those three things, humble themselves, pray, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will do these three things. I will hear them, I will forgive them, and I will heal them. That's a promise from God to you. And we say, well, wow, you know, God never hears my prayers. God never says anything to me. We're not listening and we're not asking. You see, he said, if they do these three things, I will do these three things. And you say, well, that was to them. No, no, no. This is God. Remember God. I am the Lord, Malachi 3, 6 says, and I change not. So you see, if he said it, it stands. And he can't change it. And he can't lie. So it is for us too. So if you are his people, if you are his people, because that's what he said. If you listen to it or read it, carefully, it says, my people, if my people, meaning that this is a specific promise to God's covenant people. God's people who have chosen him to be their Lord and Savior, then he will hear you when you pray. So if you are his people and your land is troubled, then humble yourself and pray. He will hear you and he will heal your land. That's a promise to you. Not for the people back there. It was for them at that time. But he can't change, so it has to go forward because it says he changes not. Jesus Christ, today, the same, today, yesterday, and forever. He will not change. So that promise is ours, and all we need to do is operate in it. But you must remember the three steps that belong to you. Humble yourself and pray and change from your wicked ways. That's what repentance is all about. And this is what he's telling them way back then, even before Jesus came. Think about that. You see, Jesus came and showed us how he was going to do it by dying on the cross for us. You see, a lot of people think that all Jesus did was save us from our sins. No. No. That's a lie. He done more than that. And as long as you keep thinking that that's all he done, the devil is glad that that's what you think. Because as long as that's what you're thinking, then he can keep kicking you in the bottom until you die. And people will walk around by your coffin and look at it, oh, did he have a hard life? Wasn't things rough for him? He never had it easy. But he had power over the devil all the time. He had power over the devil all the time. Remember Luke 10, 19? I have given you all power over all the power of the enemy. And that was the second time that he touched us with power. Because if you remember back in the beginning, even before he made us, he decided to empower us. In, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let us make man. He hadn't made him yet. He said, let us make man. And then, after we make him, let's give him dominion over everything. Let's give him power and authority over everything else that we make. Over the fish that's in the sea, over the birds that's in the air, over the cattle that's on the land, and over anything that shows up on earth. We have that power already, but we have to use it. It is incumbent upon us to use what we have. If you're sitting here today and, and has been left a million dollars in the Bank of America and you ain't using it, that's not the person's fault that who left it to you. They gave it to you. You're hungry, broke, because you haven't went to the bank and drew it out. This is the same. 
God has given us the power over all the power of the enemy, and the enemy is kicking us in the teeth every day, and we're running and hiding and asking God for help. And he says, what else can I do? I gave you the, the winning ticket already. Just resist him, and he will flee from you. See, a bully won't fight you if you fight him back. He only beats you up because you let him. And he'll keep beating you up every time you let him. But when you turn and start fighting back, then he'll look for somebody else who won't fight him. Amen. It, it's just, this is the way it is. And this is how we have to approach our life, is that we are in charge of our space. And the devil will, will beat us up as long as we let him. So until we begin to use what God gives us, then we got to keep getting beat up. But He's given us the formula. He's given us the solution. He says, humble yourself. You're not the biggest guy on the block. Be humble. Okay. Mellow out. Settle down. There's better looking people than me. I don't know where they are, but they, there are better people, better looking people than me. There are smarter people than me. There are taller people than me. There, there are all kinds of people who are better than I am in certain areas. So I should be humble because I'm not all of that. And pray, ask God, forget about it. Nobody can tell me anything. I'm a wrong man. No. God, help me with this. I give up. I can't do it by myself. But you got to ask. And then the turning point, which is mainly our biggest problem, is turning because what we do, we like to do. That's why we do that. We like that. But if it's against God's will or a sin, then we need to stop that. We need to stop. We need to turn from our wicked way. We need to change. Change our activity. Change our lifestyle. Change anything that is causing us discomfort. We change. When you're taking a shower and you got the water on too hot, that's discomfort. You change it right away and get it some cool and make it just warm so you can relax and enjoy the water beating up on your body and tingling. You don't stay in uncomfortable situations in no other circumstances other than the soul of man. we will continue to do the things that is causing us more damage than anything else in the world. And that is killing our souls. The wages of sin is death. And we go about killing ourselves daily and refuse to change because we like it. But that's the whole point of the enemy. He's never ever going to give you anything that you don't like. Jeffrey Dahmer was a serial killer. Killed people in eight. <coughs> Do you think he could have killed all of those people if they would have knew he was Jeffrey Dahmer, the killer, the eater? No. He had to be nice. He had to be something good. People like him. So they'd go out and have a drink with him. And just hang out with him. Till he got ready to do his thing. So you see, it's the same ploy that the enemy has. He will never ever give you anything that you don't like. Everything is big, bright, and shiny. Remember what Corinthians tells us? Man is only tempted by those things that is common to him. If he don't like it, you can't tempt him with it. He has to like it. It has to be something that he wants. So when your land is troubled, humble yourself. 
pray and stop or change or turn. And God will heal your land. You do your part, he will do his part. And again, he can't lie. So he has to do what he says he's going to do. Otherwise, he's not God. Is that correct? That is correct. God is God because God is pure, God is holy, and God is true. He cannot change. So when Solomon prayed that prayer and asked for those provisions, God honored that. And that means for everyone who are called by his name. Meaning his people. If my people, not just any people, but my people. So you have to be his people in order to enjoy those benefits. But it's incumbent upon you to become his people. So humble yourself, pray, and turn from whatever things that is causing you dis-ease. God will heal you. And watch this, watch this. In 2 Kings, Elijah was Elijah's servant. He was a humble servant for Elijah for years. He humbled himself and served Elijah for years. And he watched Elijah carefully and watched and saw what he did, how he did it, and heard what he said because he wanted to be like Elijah. And if he wanted to be like Elijah, guess what? He had to have what Elijah had. So he was in hope. He served him with hope. Not envy, not jealous of it, but in hope that someday that he could be just like him. And then the day came when Elijah was about to be taken away. And he said to Elijah, Elijah, you stay here in Gilgal. I must go down to Bethel. God is sending me to Bethel. And Elisha said to Elijah, as the Lord live and as your soul live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. When they got there, they met the sons of the prophets who were also in tune to God's word and God's way. So they knew that Today was Elisha's last day. So they said to Elisha, do you know that your master's going to be taken away from you today? He said, yeah, I know, but be quiet. Just be quiet. So Elijah came to Elisha again, and he said, Elisha, stay here. The Lord is sending me down to Jericho. And Elisha said the same thing he said earlier. He said, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, I'm not going to leave you. So they went down to Jericho. The prophets there were in tune. They knew it was his last day, so they said the same thing to Elisha. You know your master's going to leave you today? He said, yeah, I know, but he He finished his business, and he said to him a third time, he said, Elisha, you stay here in Jericho, I have been sent down to the Jordan. And Elijah gave him his field. As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I'm not going to leave you. So they walked away. When they got to the Jordan River, Elijah took off his cloak, they call it a mantle, and he struck the water, and the water poured. And they walked across the river, right away. And when they got across the river, Elijah said to Elisha, what do you want from me? What, what is it that you want from me? Now what? Elisha said to Elijah, I want a double portion of what you got. He didn't say, I want as much as I need. He don't, 
I want as much as you got. He said, I want more than you got. I want what you got. I want a double portion of it. And Elijah said, you know, that's something I can't give you. That's a hard thing. But if you see me when I leave, then you could probably have it. But if not, you won't. And they begin to walk on from the joy. And the prophets from Jericho were so curious, they followed to watch. And as they walked away from the Jordan River, it says a chariot of fire, pulled by horses of fire, came down from heaven and set them apart. And the whirlwind from the chariot took Elijah up into heaven. And Elijah tore his clothes and cried out, My father, my father. And then he picked up Elijah's jacket. Now, which had fallen from him as he went up. And he walked back to the Jordan River and folded it the same way Elijah did. And he struck the water. And the river parted. And he walked across on dry land. And the prophets came out of the bushes and ran up and fell on their knees. And they said, Elijah has the same spirit as Elijah. Now, Elisha, he didn't feel any difference. He didn't feel any difference. Because feelings can account for nothing. Feelings don't account for nothing. But some people, that's all they, they, they only count on their feelings rather than on what they know. You say, oh, my feelings are hurt here. My feelings are <clears throat> without operating on what they know. Elijah used the same coat that Elijah had used, and he got the same results. The same results. So it says that God is no respecter of person. I'm saying that what we see and what we know and the things that we read about in the scriptures, and say, oh, aren't those beautiful stories? No, those are not beautiful stories, people. Those are instructions written for our example because God is the same all the time. So when we see these things, these things will work for us just like they work for them. God is not a respecter of person. What he done for one, he will do for the others. Amen. Everybody is the same in God's eyes. He created us all the same. Amen. So Elijah functioned just like Elijah, but he done twice as much as Elijah had, and I hope you notice the fact that just like Solomon, Elijah asked for something that benefited others. Didn't ask for anything for himself. He asked for something to benefit others. Am I, are you listening to me? Mm -hmm. How many times do we pray for something that we can give to somebody. Lord, give me a new Mercedes Benz so I can give it to. No, we want it for ourselves. That's what we pray always for ourselves. But if we notice in these two examples, extreme examples, that these men were asking for things for other people, not themselves. Okay. Esteem others higher than yourself. Jesus Christ came, died for your sins. He esteemed you higher than himself. Amen. Imagine that. And how often do we disregard the life or, or the suffering or, or the need of other people in order to enrich or uplift ourselves? Let me run through our minds a little bit to you. Sometimes when you're talking, you disturb people's thought pattern. But if we'll be quiet for just a second, think of that. I never prayed for anything to give to somebody else. I never prayed for anything to be able to help somebody else. I never said, God, give me strength to go over and pick up somebody off the floor. Or bless me with enough gas in my car so I can take somebody to work. I never prayed for anything that, that would 
benefit somebody else. Everything is for me. I am all consumed. And once that we decide that we can help other people and do things for other people, then we will look at God more for his help to us. And appreciate it more. You see, because sometimes we get gifts from God and we say, Whoa, we wasn't that lucky. And run off and be happy. Never once said, Thank you, Jesus, for this windfall. Or, or this, whatever it was that you got unexpected. But God gave that to you for a reason. Now, what you did with it, we'll never know. Did you use it for the purpose that he gave it to you? Or did you just go out and buy yourself a new pair of boxer shorts? I'm not spending this, this money on whoever. Because it probably entered your mind, I should give so and so. And God gave you a windfall, and soon as He gave it to you, you forgot about doing what you thought about doing. You see, nothing just happens, people. Nothing just happens. God <coughs> is sitting on the throne at the right hand of God, interceding for you and hoping that you will do what He died for you to do. To prosper and be in good health. To live your life abundantly. We, we have to get a handle on who we are so that we can do what God said that we should do. We are our brother's keeper. We are our brother's keeper. Well, I don't want to get involved with that. I don't, I, ain't, I don't know him. I ain't going to tell him nothing. I don't care what he do. Yes. If you don't tell him, he'll never know. He will always be running around dumb, doing dumb things, because nobody told him that that's not what you're supposed to do. Well, it ain't my business. I'm not going to meddle in his business. You're not meddling. You're offering assistance. Now, whether he takes the advice or not, I'm not saying throw him down and you better listen to me and just, <laughs> just tell him. You can't force it on him. You tell him. See, this is what God does to us. He just tells us. These are the written instructions for our example. He don't make us do it. He could, but he doesn't. So if we take the same part and we just tell people what we know to be true. That's the message that we're supposed to carry forth. That's what he said to do. That was his last instruction. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Gospel, spreading the truth, telling people what is right and what is wrong. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do it, who's going to? It will always be wrong. Because 